Still just about good morning, everyone. Tell me if you can't hear me. Um, oh, I'll go back to the blank one. Um, at the last minute, I was informed we had to put various MOLA logos on things um, uh, for a sense of corporate solidarity. However, um, my um, although a lot of the information that I'm going to summarise very quickly for you in the next 20 minutes is derived from work that I do with MOLA, where I work half-time as the ancient woodwork specialist. And obviously, wood being waterlogged is often found associated with tidal waters, the Thames and its tributaries like the River Lee, uh, the Medway, and so on. Um, but not all of it is. Some of, it's, some of the, the insights have been gained through living on um, tidal waterways in and around Greater London. And I live now above the River Swale, and many of you will know it's not a river, but it is in North Kent. It's actually a tidal sound between the mainland and the Isle of Sheppey. Um, you'll see roughly where it is on the map in a minute. Now, when you're, you, you grow up in that kind of environment and you live and work in it, I worked as a waterfront carpenter before I got involved in archaeology, you get a very kind of visceral understanding of tides and what they mean at a human level. But a lot of people in archaeology who studied these kind of issues are geologists who do work in muddy places and do have to understand tides, but they don't do this work sort of on a daily basis. And what I'm trying to do in the talk I'll give you now is a, is a kind of practical introduction to this work. So it's partly molar work, so you can look at that thing over there as a logo, and partly not. <laughs> okay? And uh, here we go. Some of the work has been done with other archaeological groups on secondment, to Oxford Archaeology, Preconstruct Archaeology, other groups, including amateur groups as well. Now, if you don't understand tides, it can have serious consequences. I can hope you, you can all see this. One or two of you might recognise this is the at Bosom in, on the south coast, northeastern part of the Solent area where I lived for a while as well. Um, some of these consequences can be life-threatening, uh, not just 20 years ago, as you can see in this slide, but actually for our early ancestors. Oh, by the way, I'm only talking about the period um, of the last 2,000 years, the story of uh, relative sea level changes at a practical level for prehistory is, is, is uh, something for another day. I'm also uh, probably not intelligent enough um, and certainly not motivated enough to talk about the, the, the reason sea level change has happened because there are so many reasons for that. In general, the sea level has risen worldwide since the last glacial period, but there have been occasions, you'll see, where the sea level has dropped, often quite fast, for short periods in prehistory and in early history. Uh, we've known this for quite a long time, but uh, we're now refining the picture. This is uh, near where I live now. This is looking down um, at one of the uh, western Frisian islands, as I would like to see them. In the middle of the slide, this is the Isle of Harty. These are now joined together with uh, the Isle of Elmley, with, with Sheppey, to form one island called Sheppey. But essentially, there's a chain of islands all the way from the south-west corner of Denmark at Reba, the oldest town in Denmark, all the way up to London, with a very small gap in the channel, which was smaller in early his, uh, history because sea levels are much lower than they are today. So this is the Inland Passage. Okay, We're looking at part of the sheltered Inland Tidal Passage, um, pointing east towards, um, in this view, pointing east past Whitstable towards the Netherlands. Okay, bit of a fuzzy slide, sorry about that. Um, it's also curious how the slides are divided up into these square blocks. I suppose it's a kind of grid. But I hope at least you can see the word London. And this is the southeast corner of the, the country. The blob down here, which one or two of you might be able to see, is the Isle of Sheppey. Um, so I'm mainly talking about things which are based on evidence recorded and experienced in real life from the Solent through to London and up into Essex and into Suffolk. I was interested to read in the IGNA journal today um, that Sutton Who is in Sussex. Uh, some of you may realise this is wrong, but uh, a lot of this will, will actually apply to this whole area. Um, on the Thames we have big tides. They're not the biggest in Britain. We'll hear more about Seven Estuary later. Um, here you can see a human scale, which I think is or vaguely human scale, which I think is me. Um, and this is at Cold Harbour on the river, the north side of the river uh, in East London. And the, river, the historic river wall is eroding away. It's got timber phases, brick phases, and so on. But the point of this slide is to illustrate how big the tidal range is, dropping about a metre below where I'm standing, 
and rising all the way up here and very occasionally higher. This wall has been um, essentially Victorian early 19th century, has been extended twice in concrete, and at the top, the level of that is at 5.85 metres on the national levelling system we call Ordnance Datum. Um, now, that is the kind of level that you were supposed to build river walls to on the Thames before the barrier was built. Now, 5.85 metres is 5.85 metres above the equivalent level of the late Roman period. So just take that in your minds for a minute, because our seascape, our riverscape, our estuarine scape has changed absolutely dramatically over the 2,000 years. And uh, it's quite hard to get your mind around that, uh, even if you are familiar with these kinds of environments. Um, again, uh, Wise Man of the Thames is partly guilty for my interest in this and the whole issue and uh, setting off the train of arche the archaeological study of um, historic changes in tidal levels. Uh, you can see the River Thames and Gustav there uh, doing uh, Thames foreshore archaeology. Well, oh, this is really fuzzy. Well, it's a faded view of, from the old molar archi or pre-molar archive in the museum. You can just about make out, I hope, that we're looking at a series of late medieval waterfronts from the Trig Lane site, um, a project that Gustav led uh, in the early 70s, and he was soon to realise that the rates of decay and the positions of the decay in the waterfront structures, which could eventually, and more recently mainly, be dated well by tree ring dating, could be related to, we're looking sort of northwest here, could be related to dry land surfaces just behind them and could act as give us a kind of time clock relationship of relative sea level, where the big high tides were reaching or expected to reach at the period at which these structures were built, in this case in the 14th century or late 13th century. And we built on, on that more recently, and you'll see that at the end of the talk. But here he was able to develop quite early on, with the help of, of Chrissy and others, um, uh, some, some general ideas about where the various levels, the tidal levels, were. I'll explain what some of these abbreviations mean, uh, where you can read that for you yourselves there, but I'll try and explain them in human terms with a diagram a little bit later on. And this was the first effort to really look at... Um, how different later medieval um, tidal levels were for people living on the banks of the Thames and boats and ships using the river and what the tidal range may have, have been. Now, it's very difficult to work that out from looking at waterfronts and dry land immediately behind them. Uh, this is the lowest astronomical tide and we now know, in fact, that the tidal range was vastly bigger in the medieval period than initially thought, but it's, it's a difficult thing to work out until you start to dig up tide mills, as you'll see. So this is um, uh, Gustav and others moved on to work on the Roman port and similar ideas about how the archaeology could tell us something about tidal uh, levels or relative sea level change was uh, generated at Pudding Lane in this case. Mola has done more excavations there in a limited way since and we can refine the dating of some of these structures slightly. Um, this timber is preserved because it's wet. This is three quarters tide on a, on a spring tide uh, just before AD 100, if you like, with the water coming in here in this picture. And little bits of timber right up here are preserved because they're wet, because the water is reaching that kind of height, allowing a little bit for capillary attraction upwards in deposits. I hope you can see this. I don't know how fuzzy it is or otherwise. Um, and with, with that work, over many years, it was possible to work out the series north and the land is on this side. We're in the city here, walking, working towards the river that way to the south. There were a series of Roman waterfront structures built through time. I haven't got some of the very latest ones on here because I couldn't fit them in the slide easily. And we found by looking at those, and this also involves the work of Trevor Brigham, who worked particularly on the Roman port and river levels, that the, the relative level at which people could live, where the big high water springs were reaching, had dropped through the Roman period. Instead of going up in the general trend, had dropped dramatically over 200 years by two metres. And that has huge implications for understanding your foreshore archaeology. The use of the port for shipping the Roman port actually moved downstream towards the Chadwell area um, during this period because there wasn't enough water to get in for the larger vessels to get in close to London anymore. Ignore the coloured bits on here, but this, some of you might recognise this diagram, which is looking at um, this issue uh, in the Roman period, um, starting with... Uh, Shoreside occupation levels actually above two metres. We push them up a bit nowadays, above two metres OD, still three metres below what they'd be today. 
and then dropping right down towards about 300, and then coming back up again. And the big um, time period we lack good information from is the very late Roman and very early Saxon. We're beginning to get a bit of very early Saxon stuff, and this all needs collating more. We're getting some through the Tideway project and excavations in the lower Lee Valley in particular. And we're going to start filling that picture in, but at the moment, um, the reason I'm speaking to you in a dialect of Frisian with a bit of French added is very linked to these massive tidal changes. Because if people living on the east side of the North Sea didn't have the land anymore, or the younger sons in the family didn't, they had to go somewhere to, to, to earn a living and to be able to grow their food. And a lot of them came west. All kinds of reasons for saying that, but what we're, what we're looking at here is how fast was this dramatic... Um, uh, life-threatening change in, in sea level and the drowning of the farms on the east side of the North Sea and so on. And, um, you know, foreshore archaeology can contribute to this. Waterfront archaeology can, but it's much more difficult when you're looking at things like this Saxon fish trap in the, the foreshore zone towards the lower part of the tidal range today um, to use this information for this work. So it is tricky because you haven't got the wattle work or hurdles or what are called dead hedges that would have formed the barrier within these fish traps. You've got the stakes beneath that level. So you haven't got a fixed level you can tie in very easily there. There's some information there, but most of the fish traps don't have the horizontal elements. So it's part of the story, but it's more difficult to use than what would be the equivalent structures up here off the map on the landward side. Uh, and to some extent, information from Rex too. And unfortunately, underwater archaeologists, and I know there are one or two here, um, haven't really considered these kind of issues very much. There are several reasons for this. One is that historically it's very difficult to take levels underwater. And secondly, on charts, the chart datum levels for reference vary from chart to chart, unlike our OS maps, which have the same ordnance data. So, you know, thinking in terms of locking your mind into a, a level plane and relating the structures or boat wrecks or whatever you find to that is, is very difficult for underwater archaeologists. So you have... The foreshore is floating about between the two extremes uh, and it is easier for us working on land or the edge of the land that tips onto the foreshore to conceptualise these things and work with them. This is a picture some of you will recognise of the Gravely boat found in 1970 near where I live now. It's an interesting little scale here that no one will be able to see except someone with very sharp eyes. It's the walking stick scale. I have a lovely film, a cine film converted to video of the excavations in 1970 of this. This is a, a, a drainage canal a uh, drainage ditch that was dug through the salt marsh just east of Faversham there, which revealed this vessel. This vessel is lying on a, on a wooden hard at about, very roughly, uh, minus 0.5 metres OD, which at that time, this is roughly around 950 AD, would, would be about um, uh, two metres below where the high tides are reaching. So this is massively underwater, but still tidally accessible, and bits of the vessel have been cut off in fact, in this area here, uh, with access to people salvaging the timber for reuse. Um, this is a crude artist reconstruction of work we've done. The, the beach market at Bull Wharf, which some of you might have seen publications and reports on earlier. Um, in the Archaeological Journal, recent issues, we've published a series of uh, large papers, which are all we can do in terms of reports. Uh, Bull Wharf is Queen Hyde, and it's modern guys, or Ethelred's Hyde then. Uh, we're on the western, the eastern side of it, sorry, it's an inlet. So this is actually the inside of the inlet on the out, going out into the river uh, around 900, 950-ish, or well, nearer 900 actually. We found a building with turf walls and wattle walls on a raised uh, area to the, the east side of the dock. These low jetties shown here are actually, did survive, and we found three of them in the end digging adjacent sites. There are three different kinds of vessels here, a vaguely gravely boat type thing here, a vaguely Viking type thing there, a Saxon dugout boat like the one found on the River Lee, and a huge expanded and extended dugout of Frisian type, which were called hulks, which we found bits of on the site, um, shown there. Um, uh, I'd, actually, I think you can more or less see this diagram, at least I hope you can. This is a, a ghost outline of the Gravely boat. Um, this is looking down that eastern edge of the inlet of Ethelred's Hive, stroke Queen Hive around, uh, it's really nearer 900 to 950. This is the shore side or shore occupation level, which I would call Sol as an abbreviation you can see here. A bit difficult because there's a line running through it. Um, now this HAT symbol, which you'll see in some publications discussing ancient tidal levels, means highest astronomical tide, all things being equal. 
and in this case without a great northerly storm blowing water down the North Sea. And some people think that everyone had to live above the HAT level at whatever period it was. At this period, um, we're talking about plus 1.8 metres approximately OD. So that's, um, uh, well, four, four metres or so below, to, uh, three and a half metres below today's equivalent level, something like that. So the modern equivalent level is right the way up here on the slide. Uh, so that's the reconstructed turf house. There's a boat. This is one of the jetties. And these were well preserved because they were within the tidal range. Uh, but in fact, if you, any of you live in these kind of environments, okay, you'll see that um, people actually want to be by the water. So they'll put up with minor flooding, which leaves traces archaeologically like silt and sand layers over land surfaces. And um, so in fact, I, I reckon that people are living where the big, big high... High water spring tides um, are coming um, into their, their properties adjacent to the tidal river like the Thames, it could be somewhere else. Mean high water springs is a useless reference level which you'll often read. You'd be drowned out or soaked several times a month. Uh, mean sea level is a geologist's term, absolutely no use for understanding how water comes into a river system or uh, people live. It's, and it, you will see this kind of thing in publications again and again. It really isn't a useful reference um, concept to use when you're looking at these changes. Okay, very quickly, we must go through the last slides. When you look at um, tide mills, there have been several excavations recently which I've been lucky enough to work on. This is a largely Oxford archaeology project uh, showing a tide mill of 692 at Ebbsfleet, right near the Ebbsfleet station. The mill dam on the right here was well preserved up to a level of one, plus 1.7 metres OD. Conveniently, that's almost exactly the same as the livable level, the shoreside occupation level for Middlesex and London, similar to what I showed you before for the early occupation of Lake Saxon uh, City. Um, so it's given us an, a fix on the tidal levels there, which is, is really pretty reliable. It's all tree ring dated, uh, hence 692. This is back to Bull Wharf again a bit later in 1123. We're looking at a very well-preserved stave waterfront with a deliberately laid cobble beach. Uh, a bit like the beach market I showed you an artist reconstruction of earlier, the working key surface was preserved about here, something down slightly at plus 2.2 metres. So by now we're back at the early Roman levels. Um, as we know, the big tides are reaching that level. We're now looking at another water mill excavation, the Greenwich Wharf Mill of 1194. Um, this is the first bit we could see. You can see the Thames there. Some of you know where we are. This is the landward side, the eroded mill pond is back here. This is the head race area. Um, we, it took several years to excavate all of it, but this is the bit we were just looking at. Then we got part of the wheelhouse with part of the wheel in situ, and then eventually, years later, we got to look at the tail race. This is part of the wheel in situ. So this is in the 1190s. We're looking at the base of it. And what's significant from, for the last minute or so of my talk is that the bottom of this wheel pit trough is at minus 1.15 metres OD. Um, and we know, if you, just to recap, that the, the, the occupation level at this time is about plus 2 to 2.2 metres OD, so that's uh, 3.15 metres below that level. Now, obviously, for this wheel to turn, the tide has to drop lower than that. My guesstimate is it has to drop, uh, and over the, the tidal range has to be not uh, 3.5 metres, but something like 5 or 5.5 metres at this period. Now, that is about twice what was initially envisaged from work in the 70s. So what we've been able to do is refine some of the dating of these occupation levels at different times. This graph is from a later paper where we're looking at that. Um, it's very difficult from the land edge to work out what the tidal range is. But when you start to find tide mills, you're getting some of the information about the lower levels you can reach. And if you can envisage the, the, the sort of central medieval tidal range being much bigger than we initially thought, you can also explain how the rudder on the, on the Blackfriars number no. 3 boat is missing, because people could simply wade down there and reach it. Just very, in the last few seconds, just to show you that this kind of work can be done for later periods as well, some of you who know about Samuel Pepys might remember the bit when he describes in his diaries the flooding of Whitehall and his own property and his neighbour's poo is running into his basement because the cesspits are flooded. And this is the mid-17th century. Well, this is a cross-section through a motor site in the mid-17th century at Rotherhide, a shipbreaking yard. Um, and this is just a fairly schematic uh, cross-section. This is the waterfront of the mid-17th 
uh, 1660s, and we found a gravel surface to the yard of this shipbreaking yard uh, at about the level of the top of this section at plus 3.1 metres with a tiny flood deposit on top of it, which must be that flood deposit of the 1660s. Um, so there we are. I've got a couple of slides of Roman waterfronts, but I've run out of time, so we won't go into that. But just to say, we are working on a whole series of waterfront sites linked to the Tideway project and other recent molar excavations and with other groups. And the story of the inve investigating how tidal levels change through time, really quite dramatically, at least in the southeast corner of England, is continuing. Um, and foreshore archaeologists have a part to play in this, particularly if you've got horizontal timbers. Vertical stakes and piles are difficult to use for this kind of work, except in a very general way. But at Fulham Foreshore, you have horizontal saps and wattle work. So what we need is, is for, the, for studying this aspect, is to know what the level of that waffle work is, the OD level, okay? Right. Anyone wants to ask questions later, come and get me at uh, lunchtime or whatever.